which I pre-selected. Story time with Casey. So yeah, story time with Casey. Uh, I picked these out like as I'm reading them, and Chris's was like, uh, like about age, and Chris is <laughs> older than <laughs> Chris is nine years older than me. <laughs> And, uh, and it was like, you can travel at whatever age you are. And I was like, I'm sorry, Chris, I don't do this on purpose. <laughs> um, but yeah, I'm going to read this page. Then we're going to chat about it, discuss it, um, and get to know you better. Uh, so if you don't care about the page and you just want to learn about James, skip ahead. Don't let the rituals of status limit your life options. We buy things we don't need with money we don't have to impress people we don't like. Chuck Palahniuk Fight Club, 1996. So we've already learned that I can't say anyone's name in these things. Um, Have you seen Fight Club? Yeah, Yeah, a long time ago. This is, yeah, exactly a long time ago. But uh, this is all about Fight Club. I love it. At the beginning of David Fincher's 1999 movie Fight Club, Edward Norton's protagonist, feeling alienated by the dull realities of American office drone life, finds his only sense of purpose in buying new lifestyle accessories. The strange set of circumstances introduces Norton to Brad Pitt's Tyler Durden, who has an uh, aphoristic way of summarizing their plight. Advertising has us chasing cars and clothes, working jobs we hate so we can buy things we don't need, he says. The things you own end up owning you. Though not initially a hit, Fight Club eventually became a cult sensation, compelling its viewers to ponder the limitations of American consumerist life. Curiously, while the movie itself was a dark-hearted satire, with its characters seeking meaningful existence in basement fistfights and increasingly dark pranks, many fans took its message at face value. In the decade after the movie's release, literal fight clubs were reported to have sprung up in places like Silicon Valley, uh, Seattle Megachurch, and Princeton University, which I did not know. (laughs) Um, While it might feel obvious to suggest that Edward Ed Norton and Brad Pitt's characters would have been better served by a year-long round-the-world journey than the diminishing returns of low-stakes fisticuffs. The very idea makes for an interesting thought experiment in an age when far too many people still abide by status rituals like um, conspicuous consumption. Anytime there's a dash, I can't read the word is what I found. And they they dash like six times so far. Um, Fashion and the mindless acquisition of new things. The most sensible way to resist such compulsions might not be to punch strangers in the face, but to buy a plane ticket or strap on a pair of walking shoes and humbly seek out more meaningful horizons. So, um, just face value, anything jump out to you there before I start asking you questions? I think it's interesting that the face value message is to go and start a fight club, but I feel like the face value <laughs> message from fight club is about consumerism that's true um have you been in any fist fights any fights in your day no no i'm a good little english boy we don't do that thing good little english boy we don't do yeah that <laughs> um but you like to wrestle right only when there's copious amounts of alcohol involved and that's yeah. not me that's that's a that's a different persona that's my uh, brad pitt that's your brad that's pitt. my brad pitt to me being edward norton Nice. That's a good uh, one-two punch uh, you might have. But um, was it? Uh, was this way before or like right when you first started at Tyrion? Like um, way before. Way yeah, before yeah, when you before. met Nick. Yeah. <clears throat> so Nick is one of our founders. You'll meet him later in one of these episodes. But um, tell us, tell us. But that's the story. I'm. I had no. I found out this morning what this was, and I was like, I'm going to ask about this wrestling story. Um, so give me some insight on that evening. Or so what, it, was what the, was it was the end of COVID, and we had a holiday party. So because we'd all missed all of the holidays through COVID, um, effectively all of our friends, we did a big party, and each couple or group had to pick a specific holiday that you then bought something themed for that holiday. Oh. And we celebrated a year's worth of holidays 
in an evening. So Dude, like, that's cool. It was awesome. I, it was a great way wow. to finish COVID, but it was also the first time really being out of the house and hanging out with people for a long time. Uh, so I drank a little bit too much. Um, at the end as of one it. does. As one COVID, does. COVID did things to a lot of people. A lot. Yeah. I, I drank a good bit during COVID but, and then I got outside a little bit more. But Yeah, but being outside in someone's yard and yeah, it was, uh, it was a fun little time. Uh, yeah, a bunch of our friends were there that you might meet here. I don't know. I don't know. Um, um, but like, okay, so I asked about this wrestling incident. How, what happened? What, how did that start? You're I, avoiding the question. I please. can't really remember, to be <laughs> honest. Uh, something along the lines of the guy whose house it was started, I don't know, just like the silly little like wrestling thing you used to do at summer camp. Like the whole, like you stand with your toes touching and you try and push the other person over. Okay. Or you try and make them step. So they either step forward or step back. Oh. Or the finger one, finger jousting. So you oh, point your finger and you have to try and touch the other person. Yeah. So just dumb things like that. So it started with this and then it got way, way more uh, intense uh, to the point of tackling people off of chairs. Just tackling people off of chairs and... Yeah. Yeah. Nice. We'll leave it there. <laughs> your mind is your own imagination. Mildly <laughs> embarrassed about the, uh, the whole thing. So. No, super fun. I love that story about you. Just I wasn't there, but it just seemed like a rowdy good time. Yeah. And that's what you bring. It was it was 20-year-old James coming back out, I think, was the thing. Nice. So. I, <laughs> I hear that for sure. Um, well, sweet. So um, kind of the, the questions, I want to go off of this this idea here really quick. Um, it seems to be that you found yourself in a scenario, like you mentioned COVID and you were in these like, this ritual or this routine and you guys chose to get out of that. Um, so like this main thing is like, don't let the rituals of status limit your life options. And then the first quote was super cool. We buy things we don't need, with money we don't have to impress people we don't like. Have you ever like seen that in your life or like, um, have you ever like realized you were doing something like that and then made a change or an adjustment or anything or like I don't think I've ever done that I've never had the disposable income to be able to buy things that I couldn't afford yeah uh, I've only bought the things I could afford so that I can go do the things I want to do what's uh, the <laughs> highest number of kayaks that you've owned at one time yeah one time I mm, mean like six only six only six I don't have the disposable income to buy things I don't need. I need. I use all of those on a weekly basis. Guaranteed. You would use all six yes. on one during They all were for different things, and I would use them all on near enough a weekly basis. Okay, so James is big whitewater guy. <laughs> get into that. Give us your background. Like, how did you get into that? And like, when yeah. was the first time you found that sport? And then like, and then prove to me that you used all six in one week. Okay, <laughs> so I I found outdoor. Outdoor education, uh, when I did uh, kind of an outdoor leadership college course um, in the UK. Um, but I went into the course being like, I'm a mountain biker. I love mountain biking. Left being okay. like, this is kayaking. This is the best thing ever. Um, and it's pretty much shaped my life from there. It's why I came to the States. It's how I met my wife. It's pretty much everything. That, she was a big kayaker too, right? Yeah, we kind of like, we We're met, in, we met teaching kayaking and working at a summer camp. But... Yeah, it was the reason why I came to the States in the first place. And here I am now, 13 years later. 13 years of kayaking. Um, but yeah, but pretty much it was... What it's... different boats did you have and what different <clears throat> things did they do? I'm not... So I I'm like trying to remember. Outdoors, but I'm not like... I'm trying to remember. So I outside. had a really long kayak, which I was living in DC and it was really good for getting a workout. And so paddling up river, you could do a few miles up the rapids where you okay. could pick a way through, call it attaining. Um, you commute to work that way? No, but I did that to Rock Creek once. Okay. For I walked down the hill to Coolidge Park, paddled upstream from Coolidge Park to Rock Creek when I worked at the Riverside store. And then nice. paddled back and then, yeah, back up the hill. So right now, our audio is super janky. And so I don't know if I need to tell you to not bang on the table oh, as much. Sorry. But that Probably. might be something I should tell you. <laughs> <so>. <laughs> it's helpful to know. So you can go up this. Creek in one when you're in DC. Yeah. What's some other... So then I had a really yeah. short one that's for doing freestyle tricks in. Um, Do you know the names of these? Maybe people... So I had a... Uh, at the time, I probably had a Liquid Logic Stinger was my long boat. And I was 
uh, using for attaining and doing races in. I had a Piranha Jed, I think, which was my short playboat at the time, um, which again, I was running it out. I was running a kayak school. So either on my day off, I'd go and use that or it would be, oh, I'm running a freestyle clinic. So here we go. Let's get a freestyle okay. boat out. To oh, so that. when you were instructing, you probably used different ones for different instructions. Yeah. Oh, that makes and then I had sense. my half slice boat. So the back is all squashed down, um, but there's enough front to it that it's stable. So that was what okay. I taught out of most of the time. Because okay. when you're teaching, you're not really on stuff that I'm pushing my limits on. Yeah. So it's like, oh, I can play around in this, but also I'm safe enough to be able to look after other people. That's fair. Um, and then I had my Creek boat, which is for big, scary things, which... Um, yeah, so that would be that day off. Is that what you kind of use now and on Sub Creek? Yeah. Is a Creek boat. So sometimes when we're like, we get like a bunch of rain, we'll just get a text from James and he's like, hey, I put a couple hours this morning, I'm hitting the river and then I'll be in late and then he like works late. So like James changes his work schedule even around. Yeah, the, around like the rain. When the rain happens, like a lot of times I'm like, oh man, the rain. Um, it like, you know, it's harder to go camping. Now, kayakers are the happiest when it's raining. The happiest when it's raining. But also, like, if you have the right gear, you it, it shouldn't prevent you necessarily. Yeah. It's There is a level of enjoyment difference in rain and out of rain when you're, like, just camping or something. But, I mean, it's the same with paddling. If it rains and it's nice and sunny, it's still much nicer than when, like, yesterday when it rained. It was snowing by the time we got on the river. Um, really? Yeah. It was snowed yesterday? We were at Caney Creek. It was a wintry mix. Oh, okay. <laughs> I missed that. We were like two and a half hours north. Oh, um, okay. But uh, yeah, but then yeah, we got a friend who's had a dry suit on the way, but he was in Ooh. just a dry top and everything else yesterday. So yeah, gear really makes a difference. Which again is like it costs a lot of money for a dry suit, but it just I've, it's kind of a need at this point. I don't want wet feet. So when you're in a dry suit, your hands and your like face get wet. Your hands and your face. So do you have do you have like gloves? The work or mittens or anything? I have what we call pogies. So it goes around your paddle and you put your hand inside of it. Oh, so like your water cover. gets in there. Yeah, yeah. But it's sure. neoprene, so it warms up like a wetsuit. And oh. then, so your hands stay nice and warm. That's nice. But it means you get to hold on to your paddle, which I prefer. Some people paddle in gloves, but I prefer okay. pogies. Um, well, sweet. Well, one more uh, kayaking related question. Uh, I could talk kayaking all day. To throw you on <laughs> before we move on to like how you got involved with Taryn and what your role is here and everything like that. Um, but there's this famous race, the green race uh -huh. that was called, uh, where is that? It's in North Carolina, North Carolina. So it's close by to Chattanooga. Um, and it's a monster race. Like it's a pretty sketchy, dangerous, like when it's running, it's like only like pros to my pros, like legit people run it or like describe there's, that. There's, I don't, I'm doing it not justice. For the race, it's pretty intense just because it's, there's a lot of consequence to getting it wrong on that river because it's pretty shallow. Okay. There's a lot of rocks. There's a lot of very unsafe spots on that river. Yeah. Um, but I mean, year on year, they're getting more and more people running better and better down that race course. Sweet. So who, do you know who won it this last year? Um... So Dave this is 2024, 20, and so last year it would have been 23. I, I'm assuming Dane won, but I'm not 100% if someone else might Jackson? be. Jackson? Yeah, Dane Jackson. Okay, yeah. Dane he's Jackson, a local boy. Yeah, he's, he's what, the, the pink boat? That's the his pink thing? pink boat, yeah. Um, so if you ever want to look up Dane Jackson, he'll, he'll be in the pink boat these days. He's a badass on the water. Just um, doing tons of first and I guess is it called first ascent, like climbing or what is it called? First ascent. Kind of first ascent. <laughs> That's funny. Um, so I know you've run that. What year did you run that? Or did 2015, you run 2015 was the year I raced. It was my, I hadn't run the river in two years. I had one practice lap <laughs> the day before the run. Did you place um, or how did you do? Oh, no, no, no. I made it into the highlight reel for Carnage. Nice. Uh, that's so how this I did. highlight reel. So if you find the highlight reel somewhere near the back, uh, near the oh, it's like the 15, 16 minute mark, I think. Uh, there's me dropping into uh, go left, uh, trying the race line for the first time ever. Never run that line. Flip over, get surfed in the hole. They get a nice close up on my face as I roll up, going. <laughs> uh, yeah. So why? I know this answer, but why is it called go left, James? Because uh, you're meant to go left because the right has a big sieve in it and you, you might die. Yeah. So 
you don't want to die, number one, right? <laughs> number two, going left. It's much cleaner. It's cleaner. Than going right. Okay. So what did you do? I went backwards uh, through the right slot with one hand on my paddle. Oh. So you went backwards through the correct one? No, backwards through the wrong side. So you went backwards through the wrong side, which technically, if you were backwards, was going left for you. <laughs> <laughs> right? I guess technically, yeah. Technically, I still went left and I was facing upstream. And <laughs> to ask this question seems a little ridiculous, but did you die? No. The the death part is more of your outside of your kayak, really. Oh, so, so you didn't die. I didn't die. So he went backwards right, left, and didn't die. And I'm still here. Thank goodness, you. right? Yeah. <laughs> Sweet. Well, that's, I just, whenever I heard that story, um, I love the idea of you technically going left. Yeah, I never thought about it like that. That's a different perspective on it. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, sweet. Well, let's speed up to now. Um, so, what were you doing before you got involved with Taryn? What's your connection with Taryn? Um, I talked about Chris. And kind of the origin um, and, and how we founded the company when the idea came from uh, in our last episode. But uh, just want to, you know, touch base on like your experience from like being in Chattanooga for a minute and then um, connecting with us and then the past uh, couple of years, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. So like I said, came from, moved down from, well, we're in Boston after DC. I've always done outdoor work. It's kind of how I traveled around doing outdoor gigs. So outdoor retail is an easy kind of like short fix, they're always hiring. Um, and I moved to, moved to Chattanooga kind of on a whim. Uh, and I was like, oh, it'd be really easy to find some instructing work down here. And it turns out it's not. So yeah. I uh, I applied at Rock Creek and got a little job at Rock Creek at the Riverside store and then got the became the manager when the current manager was leaving. Um, so ran the Riverside so store. So describe what's Rock Creek for those nights? Oh, Rock Creek is our local outdoor store. Um, and then the store that I worked at was kind of our paddle sports focused with a bunch of other stuff um, location. So we have this, it was a big warehouse. So we have the space for mountain bikes and kayaks nice. and rafts and all that kind of stuff. If you're looking so. for a good podcast, the um, one of the founders of Rock Creek, uh, Dawson Wheeler, has a podcast that he runs called Day Fire Podcast. So check that out. Uh, Chris and Nick have an episode uh, when they founded Taryn at the time it was named Treka. So if you're looking for an interview of our founders with uh, yeah, the founder of Rock Creek, which is our local outdoor mm-hmm. store, as James described, check that out. Um, but yeah, keep going uh, with what you're what you're telling us about your uh, yeah. connection. So I work there, but outdoor retail is notoriously makes it notoriously difficult to go and enjoy the outdoors, uh, just with hours and all that all that kind of stuff yeah um you're kind of like committed to certain hours and yeah afternoon times and all yeah. that it's people leave people leave outdoor retail so they can go and do outdoor stuff this tends to be how it goes but that's yeah. kind of how i got here is through a friend through a paddling friend who was working at rock creek when i was there and then he knew nick and chris and you know chris left much i know chrysler i knew his wife more yeah. than i knew him until nice. until the past couple of years but yeah but yeah he, he kind of showed me around the he showed me around the Chattanooga paddling scene, and I think I paddled with Nick at least once before Nick came and uh, request like well, asked me if I wanted a job to uh, earn a little more money and nice. have more time outdoors. So we <laughs> learned, or we were like, "Hey, we have a bunch of stuff that's like kind of fucked up, or just like in a it's it's in a." ramble or a mess it was complete chaos yeah and so we were like (laughs) as we were like starting a business we had like you know limited opportunity of where to be how to store our goods um and then we started growing and having some success like in our sales but then that added a lot of time to um that you know shipping out the orders was our number one priority to get customers their product but that month over month week over week whatever day every single day it kind of got more of a like a clusterfuck yeah. and so i think what it was was chrysler said that uh he's really good at taking something terrible or a mess and just <laughs> like hammering down and like making it workable and so we were like yeah that sounds like somebody that we wanted the team yeah it's a good description yeah and so um working out of an office that was about this wide really 
Yeah, it was really small. We had a 400 square foot office. With no windows. With no windows. And the hallway was, there was no door at the end of the hallway in this old, old warehouse that had like leaks in the roof. And it was like, if a customer ever found us online and wanted to come inside and purchase and try things on, it was like, we would write back to them on email or over the phone be like, we promise you we're legit and we promise you we're not going to kill you when you come into the office because it just looks so scary. And like you're walking down a big aisle in a warehouse to a dead end. And then all of a sudden there was a door around the corner and there was our office. Yeah. And friendly faces and friendly dogs. And yeah. yeah. But um, so talk to me about like um, what was kind of the first things you did for us and then where are you going next for us as, as we grow? Um, yeah. So came in to handle the, the warehouse and customer service and all that jazz. So like all of our orders that go out <clears throat> run through James, all of our, any requests that you guys have or anything, you're likely talking to James on the phone or via email or any of our like, um, like review support, anything like that. Yeah. That's all me. So yeah, you can imagine the English accent coming through on an email. That's what it sounds like <laughs> in my head when I type them out. I wonder if there's a way to like, like force, if people like listen to their email to force it to be read in like series English person <laughs> it's worth a try um, um yeah and then uh, so we recently just uh brought on someone to help you with that so what's your new um yeah so now our now towards? our push is to help grow our retail presence so we're finding more small independent outdoor stores and yeah just trying to get everybody stoked on terran all across the US. well there's somewhere a physical location people to get stoked on terran nice. uh, around the u.s so what's the reasoning behind going that like independent uh, store versus just like jumping into REI nationally right now for us? Yeah, so big, big box stores, I just feel like you don't get the same level of service or knowledge that you can get out of a smaller independent retail store. But like smaller, smaller stores tend to have more of a, you know, kind of like a family vibe a lot of the time. Yeah. Um, and yeah, they just seem to fit with our ethos a little better. Yeah, um, I think so. Too. Rather than getting lost in a massive conglomerate of stores where you don't really see a staff member for 10 minutes while you're lost in the back of a store. Yeah. Nothing so, against REI. I think REI is one of the big box stores <clears throat> that we will eventually yeah. pursue to get into. I'm not just, saying that they're not knowledgeable. They obviously have very knowledgeable staff. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> I think also for us, like the size we are right now, we also want to we want to get into those hyper focused retail stores. So then, yeah. um, you know, as a new brand, we want to, um, you know, make sure that people have the information, like you mentioned, those mom and pop or the more independently owned have that like that really good knowledge. And for us, you know, telling people about new products, new brands, it's a it's a it's a really good fit for us. So I like that. Um, and then eventually, you know, we'll pursue those big box stores. I yeah. Think. Yeah. Eventually it'll be, that'll be the, the next, the next leg up, but yeah, just kind of building it from the ground up. Um, yeah, it's been fun. Sweet <laughs> stuff. Yeah. I think we've got, um, a handful of stores in the Southeast right now. Uh, yeah. if you are watching this or, um, yeah, leave any comments that you want about any questions for James or anything, uh, to get to know him better and then we'll reply to those, but also like. If you have, what's your favorite outdoor retailer in your local town? We would yeah. love, uh, if you love Taryn and you love rocking our gear and want to be able to try it, future products on, uh, we want to be in retailers and we're, we're pursuing that uh, this year. And so, yeah. So who are the outdoor retailers uh, in your local um, cities or towns that you want to see Taryn in? And we'll reach out to them. If you want to make a connection, that would be great too. Yeah. <laughs> Go um, tell them they need to stock Taryn and then give them our email. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, thanks, man. Do you have anything else you want to say? That's anything weird. else you want to share? No. What's your wrestling story? You've got to have a wrestling story. I have various stories. <laughs> that will... <laughs> They'll that, come out on the later later podcast. I'm the interviewer. You know, <laughs> you um Later for that one. Uh, I told Chris, I don't know how to end these yet. So, yo, yo, we're doing that. We're getting weird. <laughs> All right. Okay. So I almost forgot. Uh, I'm supposed to ask you the same question every single time. What is your favorite Terran piece or Terran product? 
Yeah, I, my my favorite term product is the Traveler tea, our yeah. Merino tea. Um, I wear one pretty much every week, and I wear one for an entire week. He looked down and he realized he's wearing a prototype of something. <laughs> and was like, uh, I'm not wearing it. I'm not wearing it right now. Damn it. Um, uh, but yeah. Okay, so like, so it's what great. about it? So it's fantastic. I literally wear one for an entire week. Like I just had this conversation with my wife last night and she was like, I have so many clothes in the laundry and you have two pairs of pants and a t-shirt. And I was like, yeah, look how much I'm saving on washing clothes by wearing one Merino t-shirt that I can wear an entire week and it doesn't smell. Um, it looks as fresh as it does at the end of the week as it did at the start of the week. Um, I also, I wear mine just as a daily wearer, as yeah. look like my t-shirt, but I also wear it um, when I go kayaking as a base layer. I wear it when I go hiking or any other outdoor activities because really good at um, wicking that sweat away, helps with a little bit of thermoregulation. Nice. Um, so we learned yeah, about James, cold. James goes commando. Because he only has one tee and two pairs of pants. And he doesn't wear socks either. Is what I just learned about James. That's it. No one to wear no <laughs> socks. Don't hold me to that. Nice. Well, awesome. Yeah. I mean, I love yeah, that piece That's too. my favorite. I wear it all the time. Nice. It's hard and, to pull anything else out of the drawer. And favorite color in that line? Favorite color. Between the black and the sage. The black's hard yeah. because I have my dog has white dog hair. That's true. So... That shows up, but the sage hides everything. So that is nice. Yeah, the sage is pretty rocking. <laughs> That's um, a cool color. I'm typically a like black tee, black pants, yeah. black puffy. Obviously, with Tara and I've tried to diversify and, and go outside of my comfort zone. But if and you order I, that, if you order that from my website, I always think of it as the Casey special. Black <laughs> tea, black pants. When I pack it up, that's a Casey special. <laughs> nice. I like the dark navy. It's dark enough where it feels like. Um, I had it on this weekend. Uh, yeah, it just feels like it fits me. Yeah, that's what I wore last week. Was the navy <laughs> nice? <laughs> yeah, okay. I have a black. This is a look how wild film festival. That's I our daily driver tea. Yeah, but we put um this graphic on there for that film festival we sponsor every year in January. But yeah, well, thank you. Um, yeah. well, I we signed off earlier. I forgot the question though, so we're gonna do it again. It sounds good. <laughs> All right, see ya. Yeah. <laughs>